Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at chapter 22, which is all about short-term decision-making. Uh, it's actually one of my more favorite chapters to cover because we actually start to look at how we can make decisions using all this accounting knowledge that we've gained throughout the course. And one of the things that we do when we're making short-term decisions is to break up our income statement into what's called a contribution margin format income statement. So here we can see the traditional format, revenues minus our cost of goods sold, the cost of our merchandise, gives us gross profit. With that gross profit, we have to have enough to pay all of our operating expenses and then to uh, hopefully pay ourselves some profit or net income at the end. The contribution margin income statement classifies expenses by behavior. So we take our revenues minus our variable expenses. That gives you contribution margin. Then we subtract fixed expenses and that gives you operating income. So the contribution margin format income statement would only be used internally, primarily by management to make a lot of these what if type um, scenarios or to take those into account. Both formats are going to report the same operating income. And then the traditional format, obviously, is what we use under GAAP for financial reporting purposes. So when we're talking about decision making, there's some basic um, steps in how managers go about making decisions. And if you think about it, for, for many dis types of decisions that we have to make, they do indeed follow this decision making process. So typically, you define a goal. You identify alternative courses of action, you gather and analyze relevant information, compare those alternatives, and then choose the best alternative. What's missing from this particular graphic will be the end, um, which is to actually go back and analyze the decision and see did you make the correct one or not. So management's decision making process not only takes into account financial information, but non-financial information as well. So non-financial information could relate to um, employee morale, employee satisfaction. We could talk about impacting the community, pollution, sustainability, all those kinds of factors that are much harder to quantify, but uh, also carry a great deal of weight. So we can't just make decisions always based on financial information. We also need to take into account the non-financial considerations. So what we're going to be talking about today is something called differential analysis or incremental analysis. So essentially, we want to take into account the alternatives that will, or the, the uh, revenues or costs that will vary between two different alternatives. So it could be just the revenues that vary between the alternatives, just the costs, or both the costs and revenues may vary among the alternatives. And as I mentioned, it's also called incremental analysis because we're only focusing on the differences. Anything that stays the same between two different options, we can ignore that because if it doesn't vary, um, then there's no re reason to focus on that, which is why it's called differential analysis. We're going to focus on the differences between two alternative courses of action. Now, there's a couple of different concepts here that are important to mention. Put it in space there. The first one here is called uh, relevant cost. So we are only interested in those costs or revenues that differ across alternatives. We call those relevant costs. Irrelevant costs are um, items that do not vary between alternatives. Sunk costs are another type of non-relevant or irrelevant cost. Sunk costs have already been incurred and they're not gonna change regardless of what decision we've made. Um, they've got a great example here. If you've already purchased a machine and now a new more efficient machine is available, the book value of the original machine is a sunk cost. It's not going to affect your new decision because it's already been incurred and it can't be changed. So it's not going to vary even if you um, decide to buy a new machine. Opportunity cost is the um, what you give up when you select to take one course of action. And they've got a good example here as well. If a machine is used to make one type of product, the benefit of making another type of product with that machine is lost. I like to ask students when we're in class, what are you giving up to be with me here this evening? 
and they usually will say things like I could be watching TV, I could be spending time with family, sleeping, eating, doing homework, working, making money. So you always have an opportunity cost for every single alternative that you take. So we are just going to focus in on four basic types of decisions. So just a few, just to give you a flavor or a taste of um, the different types of analysis we can run. We can look at, should we accept a special order? Um, do we want to drop an unprofitable product or segment or department? Uh, should we outsource, meaning make or buy the product? Or should we sell a product or process it further? So let's look first at, should we accept a special order at a special price? Now, essentially a customer will come to you and they say, hey, I will buy 10,000 units, but I want you to give me a discount because I'm going to buy so many. So you have to decide if that's something you want to accept or reject. Now, we're going to make some assumptions when we're doing this type of analysis. And the first one is that sales of the product in other markets would not be affected by this special order. So we said a second ago there's some non-financial considerations. This is a pretty big assumption because if some of your other customers find out you gave a special break, to um, a different company, a competitor, they may be uh, you know, not so happy with you and also expecting to get the same sort of deal. So uh, we do have to take that into account as well, but we're gonna assume for this analysis that it's not affected. We're also gonna assume the company's not operating at full capacity. So they have some room um, in their current production line to go ahead and make additional product without um, adding any of those step costs. So we can produce the units within the existing plant capacity. So the only costs typically affected are the variable costs. So here we've got an example. Mexico company offers to buy a special order of 2,000 blenders at $11 per unit from Sunbelt. No effect on normal sales, sufficient plant capacity. They're operating at 80% capacity. Current fixed manufacturing costs are $400,000 to $4 per unit. Variable manufacturing costs $8 per unit. Normal selling price $20 per unit. So typically we would say, oh wow, it's costing us $12 per unit to make that product. $4 in fixed cost plus $8 in variable cost. I would not accept then $11 um, for that product. But here's the deal. If you think about it, the only costs that are going to vary between those two alternatives are the variable costs. The fixed costs are already covered by the other units that we're producing, the other 80,000 units. So we don't have to worry about covering those. As long as we cover our additional cost, that incremental cost of manufacturing those 2,000 blenders, we're going to make money. So in this case, $11 is greater than our increase in variable costs even though we would normally sell it for $20. So in this case, we actually should accept that special order. And you can see that here. We won't make any money. We won't incur any costs or generate any net income if we reject the order. However, if we accept the special order, our revenues increase by $22,000. Costs are going to go up by $16,000, which is that variable cost per unit of uh, four dollars I believe it was or eight dollars I apologize eight dollars per unit times the two thousand units so we would add six thousand dollars of net income by accepting the special order if we reject it we're not going to make any so in this case we would go ahead and accept the special order so here's some other questions just to consider does the company have excess capacity available to fill the order Obviously, if they don't, then you would, wouldn't want to accept less than their normal sales price. Is the reduced sales price high enough to cover the differential costs of filling the order, so all of those variable costs? And will that special order affect regular sales in the long run? Again, if your other customers find out you're cutting the deal for somebody else, they're not going to be very happy with you. So the basic decision rule here, if the expected increase in revenues exceeds the expected increase in variable and fixed costs, then we should accept the special order revenues greater than the uh, increase in costs. Or if the expected increase in revenues is less than the expected increase in variable and fixed costs, we would reject the special order. All right, let's take a look at another type. Should we eliminate an unprofitable segment or product? 
So a lot of times a company will have a product or a segment or a department that um, is producing a net loss. So there's always that question of should we get rid of that particular product or that particular department? What's important to consider here um, is the effect on the related product lines. Is discontinuing one product going to affect sales of other products? Fixed costs allocated to the unprofitable segment must be absorbed by the other segments. So if we have fixed costs, and those are going to continue even if we eliminate that product or segment, then those costs have to be absorbed by our previous existing products. So in fact, net income could go down if you eliminate an unprofitable segment. So the decision rule is we retain the segment unless the fixed costs eliminated exceed the contribution margin loss. So some other questions to consider here. Does the product or segment provide positive contribution margin? Will the fixed costs continue to exist even if the company drops the product or segment? If they can eliminate those fixed costs, that's one thing. But if they're going to continue, that's something else we need to consider. Are there any direct fixed costs that can be avoided? Will dropping the product or segment affect sales of the company's other products? What would the company do with the freed manufacturing capacity or store space? So here's your opportunity cost. Is there something else we could do with that space or that manufacturing um, facility to help generate more money? Uh, we've kind of touched on that. Would dropping that product hurt other product sales? And yeah, we duplicated that one. So here's an example. I've got three product lines, Pro, Master, and Champ. So you can see Champ is losing money, $20,000 a year. So in theory, you think, well, I get rid of Champ. My net income, instead of being 220, should be 240 because we're posting a $20,000 loss. But let's see what happens when we do get rid of that. What happens to the total net income? It actually falls to 210,000 from 220. And the reason is those fixed costs, let me go back, of $30,000 now have to be absorbed by Master and Pro, and there's no offsetting contribution margin of $10,000. So we've lost that $10,000 in contribution margin that Champ is providing, even though they're not completely covering all their fixed costs. So in this case, net income would go down by eliminating Champ. So we shouldn't get rid of it. We should actually try and figure out a way to make it profitable. Okay, so you can see here if we actually lay out the incremental analysis, what happens if we continue um, with CHAMP, their sales are 100,000, their variable costs are 90,000, that's where we get our $10,000 in contribution margin. Fixed costs are 30,000, resulting in a negative 20,000 in income. So if we eliminate, you can see we have no offsetting sales to offset any of our fixed costs. So we lose that 10,000 in contribution margin which is actually what ends up decreasing our net income by $10,000. So the idea here is we would not eliminate CHAMP. The basic decision rule for dropping a product or segment, if the lost revenues exceed the total cost savings, then we don't drop the product or segment. If the lost revenues are less than the total cost savings, then we would go ahead and drop it. Okay, couple more here. Seller process further. So oftentimes, Companies will have the option of selling a product as is or processing it further and hope to sell it for a higher price. So the basic decision rule here is we're going to process further as long as the um, incremental or differential revenue from such processing exceeds the differential processing costs. Okay, so other questions to consider. How much revenue will the company receive if it sells the product as is? How much will it receive if they sell the product after processing it further? And how much more then does it cost to actually process the product further? Let me give you an example. So in this case, the company's manufacturing tables and they're unfinished tables. So you buy them, there's no paint, no varnish, anything. You can finish it yourself. So it's costing this particular company $35 to manufacture one unfinished table and they can sell that for $50. So, um, the question then is they can use the unused capacity to finish the table, put some stain or varnish or paint on it, and then sell it for $60.
Now the additional cost of finishing the table includes a $2 increase in materials, $4 increase in labor, $2.40 increase in variable manufacturing overhead, and the fixed manufacturing cost won't increase. So you can see here, real quickly, we'll have a $10 increase in revenue between $50 and $60, but it's going to cost us two, four, six, eight, forty in additional expenses. So do you want to do that or do you not? And the idea is we should process it further because we would add $1.60 per unit in income. So you can see here what happens if we sell, we make $15 per unit. If we process it further, we'll make $16.60 per unit. So we'll make an additional $1.60 if we go ahead and process further. Now that's assuming we can sell the items that we process further. Here's another scenario. Sometimes we'll have a multiple products that can be um, prepared from one single product. For example, petroleum, you can make gasoline, oil, kerosene, uh, meat packing industry, they use every part of the animal, meat, hides, bones, the gelatin, um, they make gummy bears and medicine, all sorts of things. So the question is, with a multiple product case, all the costs incurred at the point where the products get split off are called joint costs. And I'll explain that again in just a second. So in the, our scenario, the joint costs are not relevant. Again, they're going to occur no matter what we decide to do, what we decide to make. So they're not relevant for seller process further decisions. They're considered sunk costs. They've already been incurred. They cannot be changed. So we ignore them in seller process further decisions. So here's an example. We can take milk. Now, think of all the costs incurred in getting raw milk. You've got to go to the farm, you have to milk the cows, you have to put the milk into a truck, take it to the dairy processing plant. Then perhaps you pasteurize the milk or whatever they do. All those costs incurred in getting the milk ready <laughs> are the joint costs, and those are common process. So any costs that occur before this point, um, we ignore in this scenario. So the question then becomes, we can take that milk and we can make cream or skim milk with it. If we decide to make cream, we could continue and process that further into cottage cheese, or we could sell it as is as cream. Same thing with skim milk. We can sell it as skim milk, or we can process it further into condensed milk. So the question is, should we sell as is or process further? So here's some more basic data. Let's say in this case, our joint cost allocated to the cream is $9,000. Joint cost allocated to the skim milk is $5,000. Now, what did we say just a second ago about those joint costs? They're irrelevant in the make or buy decision, so you can just cross those off. They're not important. What is important, though, are the costs to process the cream into cottage cheese, $10,000. The cost to process the skim milk into condensed milk is $8,000. We can get $19,000 from the cream, $11,000 per day from skim milk, $27,000 for cottage cheese, and condensed milk is $26,000. Okay, so should we process the cream into cottage cheese? So we can sell the cream as is for $19,000, or we can process into cottage cheese um, for, and sell it for $27,000. So that's a difference of $8,000 between those two options but it costs us $10,000 to make that happen. So if we go that route, we're actually gonna decrease our net income by $2,000. So in this case, we would say, no, we wanna stop and sell the cream as is. We do not wanna process it further into cottage cheese because we'll end up losing money. It costs more to process than the additional revenue earned. Let's go look at processing skim milk into condensed milk. In this case, Skim milk can be sold for $11,000, or we can sell the condensed milk for $26,000. That's a difference of $15,000 there, and the cost to make that happen is eight. Hmm, so we can make $15,000 in additional revenue, but it's gonna cost $8,000 in additional expenses. That's a $7,000 increase in net income. Absolutely, we would wanna process further that skim milk into condensed milk. Now here's my question for you. If you go to your um, customer and you say, I'm only gonna sell you cream and condensed milk, 
Do you think they're going to be happy with that? Um, probably not. So this may be one of those cases where you have to take into account the non-financial considerations and say, my customers are going to want a wide variety of milk products or dairy products. So I can't just pick and choose my most profitable items. I'm going to have to, in this case, perhaps even lose a little money um, to make sure that I offer my customers a full complement of products. If you're just looking at the financial considerations, though, if the additional revenue from the processing exceeds the additional cost of processing further, then we will go ahead and process further. Or if the additional revenue from processing further is less than the additional cost of processing further, then we would go ahead and sell and not process further. All right, I have one more, I think, decision for you, and that's to outsource. So companies will often um, wonder, should they continue making a product that they're manufacturing? or should they let someone else do it and they'll buy it from somebody else? So we call that outsourcing. So here's an example, the cost to produce 25,000 switches. Cost them $50,000 in direct materials, 75,000 in direct labor, variable manufacturing overhead is 40,000, fixed manufacturing overhead is 60. So my total manufacturing cost in this case is $225,000. So if I take those total manufacturing costs divided by the number of switches, that gives me a $9 cost per unit per switch. So let's say I can purchase the switches um, from somebody else for $8 per switch then. You're gonna say, wow, that looks like I would save $1 per unit, so I'll save $25,000. But here's the kicker, buying the switches eliminates all the variable costs, but only $10,000 of the fixed costs. So if we go back, you'll see that I'm still gonna have $50,000 in fixed costs that um, do not go away if I decide to purchase my switches from outside. So then if we do a little uh, incremental analysis, here's what happens if we make, we said our cost would be 225. If we buy, we have the cost of the purchase price of buying those switches, plus we still have $50,000 worth of fixed costs. That makes my total annual cost 250, so we would lose $25,000. We're better off continuing to manufacture those particular items. The other great thing about making a product in-house too is we have most control over that item, so we can um, follow up on quality. If you outsource, that's something that you really lose out on is having good control over the quality of the product. So let's assume here though that they could use that new capacity to, ge um, to generate additional income of 28000 by making another product. Okay, so there's an opportunity cost. So if they make the switches, they lose out on this opportunity to make 28000 making another product. So if that's the case, now it's more uh, beneficial for the company to go ahead and buy so we can free up that capacity to make the other product for an additional $3,000. Now again, you might say, well, I'm not sure for $3,000 it's worth it. But again, you can uh, sort of see that at least the financial considerations involved here. Um, questions that we cons should consider here, how do our variable costs compare to the outsourcing costs? Are any of those fixed costs avoidable if the company outsources? And what could we do with the freed manufacturing capacity? Again, if we can use that capacity to make something else that's more profitable, um, that's a good incentive to go ahead and purchase outside. So the basic decision rule for outsourcing, if the differential costs of making the product exceed the differential costs of outsourcing, then we go ahead and outsource. If the differential costs of making the product are less than the differential costs of outsourcing, then we would not outsource and we would continue to make in-house. That's it.